May I begin? Thank you. Is this, is this on? Yeah. Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to such an early uh, session. Um, uh, it's, great, it's great to be here. My name is Elon Greenberg. I'm the uh, publisher uh, and editorial director of Coda Story, uh, which is a, a digital newsroom that covers uh, the roots of global crises. And, and we uh, identify uh, overarching storylines and, and stay on them uh, and try to show a bit of the butterfly effect, the, the connections between them uh, and the, the continuity within them. Um, maybe, first of all, is, is, is Mariana with us? We have, we have one panelist, uh, Mariana Spring on Zoom. Oh, there she is. Hi, Mariana. Can you hear us Hi. okay? Hi. Uh, as, maybe we'll begin with each of you um, telling us a bit about your work. You, you all do, uh, uh, you're all engaged with technology, um, uh, but I think in, in, in quite different uh, uh, facets. So, um, actually, Mariana, why don't we begin with you? Can you tell us, um, uh, this is Mar Mariana Spring. She is with the BBC. She's coming, joining us from London. She had a late-breaking um, issue with, uh, with the podcast. Um, so, yes. <laughs> yeah, so really glad you could join us by Zoom. Uh, why don't we begin with you? Why don't you tell us about your, your work Yes, um, thank you so much for having me, and I'm so sorry that I've not been wonderful Perugia in person, <laughs> um, but so is uh, the particularly busy schedule of the past, how long has it been now? Uh, a few months or so. Um, but um, as explained, I'm the BBC Specialist Disinformation and Social Media Reporter, um, and my job involves investigating uh, the real consequences of online disinformation, conspiracy theories, um, abuse, trolling. Um, most recently, I've been working on a podcast called War on Truth, um, and that looks at the different people caught up in the information war around the war in Ukraine, uh, speaking to people in Ukraine, in Russia, and then also um, actually here in the UK, where conspiracy movements have pivoted to think that the war is a hoax, who thought COVID was a hoax. Um, and as well as that, I've done some several investigations for BBC Panorama on on the topic of anti-vax, on the topic of, topic of online hate, um, and another podcast called Death by Conspiracy that's about a man who died of COVID and thought COVID wasn't real. Um, so I work across broadcast and online at the BBC um, and very much focusing on this kind of, you know, this idea that disinformation and what's happening on social media is so tied to people's real lives and what we're seeing happen to them and the harm that can be caused to them. Yeah, it, it couldn't... It... You're in the vortex right now. Um, could everyone hear Mariana? Oh, it was. So, uh, if if perhaps we the sound quality, it's, it's difficult. It is okay. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> well, we'll make do, Mariana. Um, to my right is Aman Sethi, who is with. BuzzFeed, uh, and uh, why don't I let you, uh, formally, I'm, I'm gonna, because you probably won't uh, confess to it, uh, formally the, uh, in fact, until quite recently, the uh, head of editorial, director of editorial product at CODA, uh, and we were uh, uh, very um, uh, uh, sorry to see him uh, go, but we we're very glad he landed so well. Um, Man, can you tell us about your work? Um, sure. Uh, my name's Aman, as, as Ilan said. Uh, I, so I cover the, so I, yes, I'm a, I'm a senior tech reporter at BuzzFeed News. I'm based in London. I've got a sort of 15-year career, which uh, I began as, in fact, as a labor reporter uh, covering factories. And my, my path to kind of covering tech as we now know it, I guess, moves through what I call the, the intersections of tech, power, and money. So, um, that's primarily the, the central focus of what I do. So I look at stuff like, you know, how, how technology has been shaping the global south, but I also look at how these are often not accidental effects, but are sort of outcomes of, of larger social forces and the way that technology is designed 
So that's that's the kind of quick introduction to what I do. Great, and to my left is Aaron Sankin at the markup, and let me ask you to do the same. Uh, talk about your background in work and engagement uh, with technology. Great, thank you. Um, so again, my name is Aaron Sankin. I am a reporter with The Markup. I am based in New York City. And uh, The Markup is a, um, a relatively new um, independent nonprofit newsroom kind of dedicated to the idea of auditing um, complicated uh, technical systems and algorithms and trying to understand how they work and how they affect the lives of everyday people um, kind of with AI and focus on people in marginalized communities. My work is largely focused um, on the US but I think there are um, a lot of lessons that we can get from uh, that can be applied to looking um, globally. Um, a lot of the work that I've done has been looking at um, the systems that are employed to do content moderation, um, especially around advertising and how the biases of kind of both the users of those systems and the creators of those systems can kind of create kind of disparate impact effects on um, that can be seen and how the systems work. Um, and in addition, kind of before, um, before I had, was working at the markup, I was at the Center for Investigative Reporting um, covering kind of uh, hate and extremism and um, with kind of an eye on how like kind of far right hate groups used um, a lot of kind of like technical systems and online communities to kind of communicate and spread hate. And I think they're kind of like um, a lot of connections there in the way that you know, those groups are using these systems to kind of harm marginalized people um, and uh, the way that the systems um, are designed with kind of large uh, blind spots. So yeah. Great. I think, I think one of the things that's so important about our topic, uh, the premise of our topic, uh, is that um, yeah, you know, in uh, the, you know, if, if broad strokes, if the West produces technology, it's uh, it's it's all the rest that often um, uh, can be, if not the guinea pigs, at least the. Um, the, the, the first responders um, to the um, applications of this technology. And, you know, we, we know about harms uh, often as headlines, right? We, we know about uh, Facebook uh, uh, and uh, its uh, culpability in Myanmar um, and in, in the Philippines. Uh, uh, we, um, uh, we know about the, the, the use of biometrics and facial recognition and the whole suite of uh, privacy uh, invasive tools in, in China and, and monitoring and tracking. Um, but it's really, it's, 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 it's understanding, uh, I think, um, the granular um, that, that can really illuminate uh, what, it's, uh, what, the, what the global effects of technology are in the South. And, um, and so maybe, um, Mariana, maybe we'll, we'll begin with you. And, and if you could uh, talk to us about uh, disinformation um, in the in the global south, and uh, it's you know how it's different, uh, and uh, and how the remedies for it uh, might be different as well. Absolutely. Um, can you hear me all right? That's better. That's actually better. Yeah. Better. Good. Um, one thing I found, particularly while covering um, COVID conspiracy theories and vaccine conspiracy theories, is the different ways in which they've spread um, in the global south. Um, and one of the huge problems that we've come up against again and again investigating this is the failure to moderate um, well in a range of other languages, particularly when it comes to Meta or Facebook, um, but also more broadly across social media. Um, and you notice how you know the same post, and we saw this a lot during the pandemic. But the same post that can you know begin in uh, a whole range of different you know in in Ethiopian and then spread, uh, and that's a whole range of languages in itself, uh, and then spread in Arabic and Italian and English. You notice how it's specifically the English posts that will be the first to be labelled and taken down, and yet the same posts in other languages very much remain, and particularly around stories of harm caused by vaccines and um, we noticed how that was certainly the case that was something happening um, 
uh, a lot. The same post would be reshared showing someone who had allegedly been injured, or um, I did one story that was about the anatomy of how some one woman's foot was <laughs> went viral, um, and it was misused to push the idea that the vaccine was being used to deliberately harm and kill people. Um, and that was a post that was quite quickly taken down in English, um, but continued to proliferate across the global south and spread in different languages. Um, but it's not just about languages, it's also about the content itself um, and the different kinds of tropes that you see spreading um, in other places. Um, one of them has been you know, the specific distrust in vaccines that comes from you know, very legitimate concerns about experiments and other kinds of uh, uh, other kinds of wrongdoing when it's come to vaccination experiments and programs, but those have been used to, you know, specifically put um, black people off the vaccine in both the West and then also in the global South. And so I, I think it's been kind of both understanding the way in which um, disinformation spreads in different places and the kinds of tropes and ideas. Again, a lot of religious image, imagery playing on this mark of the East idea, which we saw spread in, in places like Brazil, but also also in, in, in some African countries. Um, and it really struck me actually interviewing, um, I interviewed Francis Algon, uh, the whistleblower just before, uh, the Facebook whistleblower just before Christmas of last year and, and, and more recently for a different investigation. And, you know, she continued to emphasize how since she gave her testimony specifically about her concerns of, for a fail, failure to protect people in the global south, from the harms that can be caused by a lot of this technology and these social media sites. She felt as though absolutely nothing had been done. And I mean, even when we've looked at countries like uh, uh, the kind of booming anti-vax movement in Holland, for example, and rallies that happened there, violence that was caused there, but also disinformation around, around uh, the war in Ukraine. You know, even in those European countries, there's been a failure of, of <laughs> uh, moderation to take down a lot of the posts that are particularly harmful or wrong or can incite violence um, and so uh, you know you, it really exposes the extent of the problem um, happening elsewhere and I have brilliant colleagues in BBC languages you know who, who look specifically at, at what's happening in, in a whole range of different regions and feel as though there just hasn't been any progress since that movie, which was almost a year ago now or not quite a year ago. Erin maybe I can ask you to pick up on that you've done a lot of reporting on moderation uh, and uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it's often in the context of uh, U.S., but marginalized groups in, in, in the U.S., whether refugee groups or LGBTQ. Um, can, I, can I ask you to pick up on that? Yeah, so one of the things that kind of made me think about in terms of, like, Facebook and issues around COVID is I had done a story, um, well, essentially, like, Real, relatively early in um, the pandemic, I started getting really interested in Facebook groups that were uh, spreading COVID conspiracy theories. And I kind of used the um, kind of intrepid investigative technique of searching for the term COVID conspiracy on Facebook and then clicking the groups tab and looking at seeing just tons and tons of groups that were just literally called COVID conspiracy, which um, seemed pretty obvious. But after doing that for a little while, I started noticing that I was getting some kind of interesting ads. And one of those was for an ad that was for, um, I guess it was a hat that uh, was supposed to protect your head from electromagnetic radiation. And then when, when you get an ad on Facebook, what you can see is um, the reason why you were targeted for that ad, and that particular ad was targeted to me because they literally said I had an interest in pseudoscience, which um, I thought was interesting that they were trying to sell me tinfoil hats after looking at COVID conspiracy groups. And the thing that was really interesting, I think, about this is one, like I reached out to the folks who were selling the hat and they were like, we don't think we're pseudoscience, we think we're, we're real. But the, the thing that I think is really interesting is that I, like, Facebook was not particularly open with how this happened, but it's like all of these things, my assumption is that they all happened kind of automatically. Like there was something that created this pseudoscience interest, and then it automatically tagged people who were, they were interested in these COVID conspiracies, and they were automatically linked that with this product that linked that with these groups. And all of these things are happening automatically, all of these things are happening um, seamlessly, and it kind of, at the end of the day, creates this whole system where there's this, this constant set of reinforcing 
beliefs. And eventually what stopped it is, you know, me going to Facebook and saying, hey, you have a interest for pseudoscience, which by its own definition is not real science, by its own definition is misinformation, and they took it down. And in terms of, um, you know... Aaron, sorry, did you, did you go to them as, as a reporter? Yeah, I went, I, I went to them, I went to them as, a, as, a, as a reporter. Um, and the thing is, like, had I not done that, and had I not had the ability and the power and the connections to go to Facebook and kind of force them to take this complaint seriously, that would still be there. That would still be in their systems. And I think, like, if that is happening to, you know, people in the United States who have that ability to connect to Facebook, like, that's absolutely happening everywhere else on the planet. And I think that's kind of, like, a, an important thing to think of, like, the systems will create these inefficiencies, these systems will create these problems with kind of negative social consequences and like the way that a lot of this stuff is, has to be stopped is manually. Um, and that, those manual stops only really come when there are complaints for people with a certain degree of power, which usually comes um, with proximity to Facebook. Yeah, I mean, like you, that. that's right. I mean, you, you hear so often uh, the, the, um, the really uh, drastic, dire problem of um, in, 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 in places um, outside the West of um, access to the ability to communicate with technology companies. And, and I think especially, of course, the social uh, companies. I mean, I, Maria Ressa had to earn a uh, Nobel Prize to get listened to Facebook, basically. Um, Aman, let me, let me turn to you. Um, uh, your, much of your career was spent in South Asia, and I'm wondering if specifically, uh, you know, how do, maybe let me ask you this, how do, um, how does um, the applications of technology, the implications of technology play out uh, in India, uh, and maybe you can talk about the how, um, uh, it, the interplay with political systems and power. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I guess one way to, to think about this is to actually take a really, really long view on this stuff, right? And if you think about the fact that um, there's, a, there's a long colonial history to the way technology actually moves through large parts of the world. So when you think about, for example, biometrics and biometric systems and biometric-based systems of identification, biometrics were pioneered in the 1850s in colonial Bengal, where the British, British administrator, William Herschel, who's widely seen as kind of like the father of you know, popularizing fingerprints as forms of identification, kind of uses it as a way to, to, to hold a, an Indian contractor who's, who's got a contract to level a road. Uh, and he says, I don't know why I did it, but I just felt that somehow taking an imprint of his hand, putting it on a piece of paper would somehow scare him into feeling like he is kind of bound to this contract, right? So, so if you think about the long view on that and then you you move forward and you think about, when we say tech, um, of course, understandably, social media companies are obviously attracting a large part of um, the kind of focus that we all have because it's the most immediate to us. But there's also a way that uh, technology has, so technology has always, hasn't always been such a closed system. So in India, for example, there is a phrase if anyone has spent any amount of time in India called jugar, which is literally hacking, right? So it's a way that in that, like, tactile technology is sort of maguired into doing something different. And we see that forms of, we see these forms of engagement with technology over like a 100, 200 year period, except that when we, and, and one very interesting example of this is as late as 2010, where I was covering a counterinsurgency, well, an insurgency in India, and somebody slipped a, a piece of paper with a micro SD card stuck on it under my door and I flipped that micro SD card into my laptop and it turned out to be a, a, a guerrilla group which has basically sent me its propaganda in five different Indian languages on uh, the Adobe format. And so a couple of months later when I was embedding with them, I was like, how did you do that? And they kind of showed me their tech lab where they had you know, cheap laptops running Ubuntu open source software. They had pirated versions of Adobe. They had you know, a solar, they had, they had kind of gerrymandered their own sort of, you know, solar power systems. Now, when you move from, say, an open source framework like Ubuntu, which actually allows people, 
uh, whether, whether they're in the global south or in the global north, to actually play around with it. And then you fast forward to you know, the black box algorithms that, that you know, ha um, Aaron has been looking at. That's a significant loss of agency for, for, user, for any user. And then when you, when you factor in the fact that this technology is, is designed in San Francisco, for example, that means that the, the way that we as users could once actually take and pick forms of technology and use them as, as our own tools is taken away now. So we're kind of pulled through this funnel now, whether we like it or not, and as it turns out, it's not optimized for, for most of us. So interesting. interesting. We, uh, at Coda, we have, we have a story coming out next week uh, about uh, the, the re-emergence of, of uh, Soviet-era uh, type uh, Samzdat, right? The, uh, where you, you have the image, right, in the 1970s of intellectuals mimeographing, uh, you know, uh, verboten works and passing it on um, from, from kitchen to kitchen. And it's reappearing in, in Belarus where they're, um, they're using physical pieces of, of leaflets uh, and putting it under doors uh, to communicate um, with each other is a kind of taking back um, of, of an old approach. Um, Mariana, are, do we still have you? She disappears, and I'm not. I'm not sure if she's. Is she here? Yes, I'm here. You're I'm here. here. Uh, Wait, I was muting myself so that I don't make any noises that echo. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, uh, you, you report on more than disinformation, but I want to I take you back to disinformation and ask you, vis-a-vis um, -vis Iman's comments, uh, you know, do, you, do you see the uh, disinformation that it's, uh, that's generated, that's homegrown, um, how, how does it differ from region uh, to region? Uh, do you see distinct um, differences? I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, one thing I've spent a lot of time reporting on over the past two years has been the COVID conspiracy movement here in the UK, um, and um, particularly most recently, the kind of radicalization towards violence we've been seeing within that movement, death threats, hate, um, calls for people to be hanged, um, you know, actually attacking people in real life. Um, and that movement is um, uh, a fascinating movement because here in the UK, it's kind of pulled together both people on the far right, um, Tommy Robinson fans, for example, and then people on the far left, particularly people who are kind of interested in wellness communities um, or alternative medicine, um, and they've kind of joined together. I did a report for BBC Newsnight last July where I kind of interviewed people on, on, from, from both extremes to understand how they were happy to, to, to march together on these anti-vax rallies where they said, you know, this is isn't legitimate in terms of questions about the vaccine, or rather it was, but muddled with extreme conspiracies, the idea that the vaccine is part of this sinister plot orchestrated by Bill Gates and the world elite to, to harm and kill people. Um, and that movement has certainly evolved and grown. There are a series of kind of big influences in the UK um, who have, have focused entirely on promoting conspiracies, and, and we've seen most recently them pivot from COVID to uh, the war in Ukraine, the suggestion um, that, uh, that, that, that the war is somehow not what it seems, that it's fake news, that photos are staged, building on the same tropes that were used frequently around COVID, but obviously that have been around for, for years. Um, I think that movement has taken a lot of inspiration from, from the US in particular, and you see how a lot of the major conspiracy influences in the UK to um, you know, copy some of the tactics and techniques uh, appear in YouTube videos with some of the big kind of anti-vax influences in the US. So I think particularly across the, the English-speaking kind of Western world, um, there's quite a lot of similarities between the disinformation movements. Um, I think that when, you, when, then when you head beyond that, you do see how um, in other places, um, in India, for example, again, there are kind of influences that take a leaf from this same book, but it's happening in a different context. And I've been thinking that quite a lot around what's happening in 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 Ukraine, because actually if you look at you know the, the, the very overt propaganda campaigns and then the disinformation tactics used by, by Russia, for example, um, and the kind of influences, so to speak, that become crucial to that, people who promote promote Kremlin lines, also influences quote unquote who have been um, uh, used by the Ukrainian um, 
uh, government. So there was one influencer, a woman called Masha, who actually is really famous in Ukraine. She presented um, Eurovision and the, um, uh, she has been sent patriotic videos on Telegram to share um, to boost morale effectively um, amongst Ukrainians. She's been sent those by the Ministry of Defense. Um, and I think understanding kind of the difference between the organic conspiracy movement and then the disinformation or the kind of propaganda battles that are born from events like the war in Ukraine is, is important. Um, and they clearly kind of operate in totally different ways. And um, the kind of involvement of the state is, is certainly different in, in, in somewhere like Russia versus in the UK, when obviously politicians and governments, you know, are guilty of pushing disinformation and promoting falsehood. Um, but the COVID conspiracy movement and the way that politics interact with it is often um, much less. Yeah. Oh, did she freeze? I mean, seems to be the case. Yeah. Okay. We. Uh, okay. We'll, we'll 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 return. I hope to Mariana. Uh, so, Aaron, let, uh, maybe that's a good segue um, uh, to ask you. You, you do a lot of uh, reporting on ha uh, hate groups in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see um, uh, the um, uh, the messaging and disinformation uh, in in the U.S. with um, with hate groups? And I know specifically you, you you're looking at uh, YouTube and the Google systems. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can ask you to speak to that. Well, I think, I guess there's, there's kind of like, I think two elements that that kind of made me think about. So one, like hate groups are, you know, in a way kind of first and foremost um, conspiracy groups. Um, uh, the, the movement is, you know, at least in the U.S. is very kind of fomented in, um, in conspiracies, in the ideas of kind of like conspiracy theories. And one of the things that kind of really cemented that for me was um, there was a kind of an, an episode of, a, of a, an older episode of a radio show by um, a guy named Don Black, who is a, kind of uh, the founder of Stormfront, which is a big hate um, white nationalist uh, web forum. And he was talking to the, uh, he was doing an interview with the founder of a uh, kind of newer kind of hate blog called um, The Daily Stormer. And they were talking about how they got both kind of like uh, The Daily Stormer got, got into the movement. And he was like, well, I started, you know, I started listening to Alex Jones. I started listening to Infowars and I got real into Infowars. And then I got into 4chan, which is like a kind of anarchic online forum where there's a lot of hate. And then he was like, well, I started doing ironic racism. And then the irony melted away. And now he was kind of like a, a neo-Nazi. And one of the things they said was like, well, you know, you know, Alex Jones and Infowars and conspiracy stuff, like, though that's a, they were very open about this is a way that people get into our movement. This is a way that people start there and then, like, come to us, um, which I thought was, which I thought was really interesting because they were very, like, kind of open and direct about it um, because that's kind of around this, like, kind of long-standing, like, racist and anti-Semitic um, ideas. And then kind of like on the flip side of that, I think you also see issues around when, you know, people who are kind of like fighting oppression and kind of fighting racism are um, using kind of these moderated systems. There are a lot of times that the expressions that they want to make are stymied or harmed. So I think an example is I had done um, a, a story at the beginning of last year looking at YouTube and looking at kind of one of their advertising systems. And this was a system where uh, an advertiser could go in and type in a keyword and it would pull up videos that were videos or channels that were related to uh, that keyword that they could advertise on. And so essentially what my uh, reporting partner, Leon Yin, and I did was we kind of created a couple lists, like a list of like hate-related terms and then a list of kind of social justice-related terms and then ran them through this um, keyword system, this uh, keyword search, and uh, found that a lot of those terms were blocked, um, that you were not allowed to um, advertise. But there were, you know, there were like kind of big, glaring obvious holes in that list, for example. You could not advertise on the term Black Lives Matter, but you could advertise on the term White Lives Matter, which is the name of a literal hate group. Um, and you know, you could advertise on the term like Christian fashion, but you could not advertise on the terms like Muslim fashion. And what this 
ultimately did was it kind of subtly created a disincentive for you know people who were talking about Black Lives Matter, who were talking about anti-racism, from saying you know from you know earning money, from earning a living, from getting commissions, from doing these videos, and you know you know things that monet things you know when you monetize things, when people are able to earn revenue from them, um, it, they're encouraged and there's more of it. So through this system, like because some of these systems are moderated, it becomes harder for people to kind of do that sort of work because a lot of times they're blocked by controls that are put in um, on the system for, for whatever reason. So I think you kind, of, you kind of get it from both sides in a way. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and sentiment analysis can be so interesting as well. Uh, when you're looking, when you when you're doing the, that, those kind of keyword searches, maybe maybe we can uh, should we open it up uh, for questions? Um, you're allowed in this room to to speak, um, but, uh, and I'll repeat it if, if if it's difficult to to understand you through your mask. Um, go ahead, and maybe you can ad identify yourself too. With the mask, with the mask yeah. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll repeat, I'm getting, I'm getting a hand signal, but I'm not, I don't know what it, I'm being told to do. No? I'm sorry. Oh, Mariana. Oh, Mar Is she back? I see, I see. I, so I need to repeat it. I, I, the, I understand. So I, I, regardless of whether you can hear it, I need to repeat. Uh, so um, thank you for that question. The question was uh, that you know, so much of the, um, so many of the obstacles are structural, uh, um, but what can individuals do? What can we all do, not just as journalists, but as I think citizens uh, to counter um, the problems that uh, Aaron, in, in particular, I think was speaking about. So maybe that's a good question for you, Aaron. I mean, I mean it's, that's a really tough question. Um, I think uh, a lot of the solutions are, I think, above the level of what like a regular person can do, like on your, I guess, on your own media diet. I mean, I think a lot of it is to really kind of like vet and be careful about the sources of your information, which is really think about like, you know, I think there is an issue when people get content from um, from social networks. Um, like, I think a good example is you know you, when you're talking about you know an article you read, you'll you sh you'll say, "Oh, I saw this article on Facebook," um, more so than, "Oh, I read this article in the New York Times or I read this article in a blog," because you found it through Facebook. And I think social networks have this kind of disinter disintermediating effect of you know, separating kind of the publisher from the content like kind of naturally and you think about it more in terms of the platform. And for an individual, I think it's probably pretty important to be like, okay, I'm looking at this news article and just stop to be like, have I heard of this news outlet before? Does their site look reputable? Um, stuff like that, um, which is a shame because it's really hard for individuals to have to do this stuff. Um, when like so many of the problems are systematic, but like, yeah. other than like other than legislation, which comes with its own for, like l much larger set of problems, I, I'm not really sure what individuals can do. Not 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 a not not a very uh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> encouraging answer. Uh, she, oh, she, she can hear us. That's great. Um, 
Aman, you spoke uh, before about uh, the disempowerment uh, that um, you know we used to be able to jury rig technologies, and uh, um, more and more frequently that that's become uh, not a, a scenario. Um, in, in, in this example, India. Um, but say, let me ask that same question to you. I'm very interested to know, you know, are there ways in which individuals that say in South Asia uh, can can um, take back uh, s some of that power or at least try to remedy uh, the implications of technology that they see as problematic? I mean, I, I, I don't know if this, this, uh, this answer would please anyone, but I think that uh, I think that individuals should take a political choice on whether they want to engage with systems that they feel disempowered by. And I think that for finally it is a, like being on Facebook or not being on Facebook is, is a choice. And I feel that, and I understand the network effects of Facebook and I understand that it has a great amount of power and I understand all of that. But, but I'm just saying that if you engage with, I think the big, I think Facebook's biggest win has been the feeling that all of us feel profoundly invested in the success or failure of what is ultimately a software product. And I think the way to do this is as a consumer of a technology to be like, this is a shitty technology. I don't want to use this technology. I'm going to stop using this technology, right? And I think that we're already seeing, well, not already seeing, because there are literally still billions of users on this, but I think there has been one way to think about the movement away from, from Facebook to you know, more closed systems like you know, Telegram groups or WhatsApp groups has been, oh my God, now these are also full of like people sharing horrible thoughts and how do we police that? But another way of thinking about this is these are users opting away from you know, a large, giant, uh, moderated platform to essentially choosing freedom of speech between networks of trust. So I think that that's potentially one way to actually move around this. Although you can see one objection immediately being that so much uh, of uh, open systems like Facebook intersects so profoundly with commerce, right? Uh, and that presents a real, uh, a real challenge to, uh, you know, to offboarding yourself. When you mean it in sex with Well, I mean, there's, you know, in, in, in Amazon's way, uh, you know, the, uh, the people do business, you know, people are, um, their livelihoods are connected to open systems more and more. Again, I think, like I said, I think these are, these are, these are not technological choices, right? These are political choices. These are that, that one has to, to act on. So again, as if you were a giant, so, so for example, there was a brief moment during the, I think it was during the Black Lives Matter movement where a bunch of corporations were like, we will not advertise on Facebook for a certain period of time because it's not a good enough job of moderating. Yeah, well, apparently three, three seconds. My apparently point. three yeah. seconds, yeah. right? So, so the answer is not always technological. And I think the problem that we keep finding ourselves in is they're like, oh, okay, wait, this is the problem. We're going to introduce a new update. And this new update is going to actually solve this problem. But it's as, as, as you know, the, I think Angela, I think said, it is structural. It is built into the system. So if you don't like the system, you need to politically move off that system, which doesn't mean that you have to, you have to deny that system the right to exist, but I'm saying we finally do have these choices. Great. Uh, any, any, uh, any further questions? Go ahead, please. Um, Aaron, sorry, let me repeat it because okay, for the, the recording. Uh, so, uh, and, and because this is for posterity, your, the markup is loved. Uh, Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, and, and, and the question is about ad tech. Uh, and uh, sorry, it was about manual. Uh, Was it, yeah, was, was the, the work you did manual, 
uh, with the keyword search or, or so so it was a it. little it was a little bit of both um, both manual and technical um, we kind of did manual so I usually so in that thing I was working with a reporting partner who was a data journalist um, and so we did a combination of kind of doing sniff tests manually which you can enter something in on the front end of this keyword search in the um, Google Ads portal and then see if it was blocked or not. But the way that we did it kind of at scale and then we're also able to kind of distinguish between different types of like responses that look blocked was um, by feeding, uh, by feeding uh, kind of structured data into an undocumented API that my reporting partner found in the Google Ads portal. So um, that was something that I was not doing manually, he was doing that side, but it was something that's absolutely like in a certain way doable manually because you know it was just you enter in something and you weren't able to you saw a block coming in on the front end and I think that's something that you know at the markup we do a lot of um, kind of like in like intensive data reporting and we work on APIs and kind of like hit the, the back ends of technical systems but I think it's also you know it's also work that if you have time and like dedication and like are willing to spend a lot of hours uh, frowning at a spreadsheet, you are able to do manually. Um, and I think that's um, kind of important and also like that manual stuff is important to do also because that's, you know, manually is how most people use the internet. So it's important to have an understanding of, you know, how people are interacting with these products. Thank you for that question. Um, yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, so that, that question was essentially about how, like. Oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah so that question was essentially about how, you know, how anyone can access, get, the, get that sort of ear of companies like Facebook um, to, if they're, you know, don't, you're not a journalist. I mean, it's difficult, honestly. Um, like, I think, you know, Facebook does have reporting tools, and all these places do have, um, do have reporting tools where you can go in and, like, make requests and, say that this is a problem or I have this issue. But you know, these companies are massive and you know, this moder that moderation is having to do, do be done at the scale of billions of people so things slip through the cracks, things get missed. Um, I mean, again, I wish I, had a, I wish I had a better answer, but I think a lot of times like funneling those like complaints and funneling those issues into groups and advocacy groups who have, um, you know, who have relationships with Facebook and who have like, pressured um, these companies in the past going through, um, you know, going through journalists saying, hey, here's this, here's this issue. But I think it's difficult because, you know, from the perspective of a large company, you know, users are, you know, you're, just, you're, kind, of, you're kind of one of a billion. Um, Aaron, uh, how much of your work uh, involves deep, deep sourcing at a company like Facebook? Or I think I know the answer because I know Markup's approach. <laughs> Uh, or is it really about uh, investigating the issue, the problem, and, and, and basically presenting uh, your findings to, to a company like Facebook and, and saying, explain? I mean, personally, very, very little um, involves kind of in company sourcing. Most of it, what we do is um, looking at the systems and kind of like looking at, like trying to systematically look at the inputs and outputs, um, as opposed to going in and under trying to like get the, get the skinny on the, Imaginations of what things are happening inside of a company, but I think you know I think both of those things are necessary in order to you know do accountability. It's important to you know it's important for journalists to you know understand how systems work, and then it's important for journalists to understand um, you know how individuals and end users are affected. It's important for journalists to understand what's going inside in those institutions, and I think those are all different different stories. Those are all different skill sets, and I think in order to do accountability, all of those things need to be happening um, in concert. And you know that's why there are lots of different media organizations doing taking different approaches. And I think that's mm -hmm. you know 
the, the way you get accountability. I'm, I'm curious, I, I'd like to ask, Mar Mariani is with us, yes? Uh, uh, how much of your work uh, is about speaking to the technology companies uh, and, 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 you know, is your story discover located in, uh, inside um, Twitter or Facebook or um, is it from the outside in? Um, I, I, a lot of, in a lot of in a lot of the reporting that I do, I do you know seek to hold accountable the social media companies, their bosses, um, and usually the way it works for me is that I will investigate or expose a harm being caused to people on social media, whether that's um, you know anti-vax content scaring uh, people off getting the COVID jab with bad information or. Um, women being targeted with rape and death threats on social media or right now I'm working on another panorama investigation that's about a teenager here in the UK um, who was murdered and his parents believe that violent content on the social media platforms as well as hate in the build up to his murder you know, contributed significantly to what happened to him and that he and the other kids you know these kids are only 14 involved um, uh, weren't protected by the, by the sites. And so a lot of what I do will be then putting, you know, those claims and those ideas to the social media sites in, in the hopes of doing an interview, which is always easy, <laughs> particularly because they don't often want to put someone up to talk about this stuff. Um, more broadly, I have kind of interviews with the, with the tech companies. Um, I, I've, I've done a little bit of coverage of, of Frances Haugen, and in fact, in this upcoming panorama, the one about the teenager, you know, she, she's involved in that and trying to understand specifically what the social media sites are or aren't doing to protect teenagers like like Ollie who, who was murdered. Um, so I, I, I'm less so the insiders, but I think in some ways what's happening on the inside corroborates or helps to better understand the harm that's happening on the outside. Um, and, you know, accountability interviews and the ability to question and quiz and speak with um, with tech bosses is absolutely crucial, but not always an opportunity that we're, we're afforded when, when doing the kinds of reporting that I do. And, and, and Aman, uh, you, you recently moved to London uh, from Delhi. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, uh, in, to cover technology and, and from London, what, what are some of the differences there? Um, you know, what, what did that move um, other than uh, the trauma that you inflicted on your poor dog <laughs> due to uh, the approach you take to covering uh, technology? Well, um, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that, um, well actually since moving to London it's been interesting because I think one of the big um, reliefs has been to move away from, from engaging with the innards of, of disinformation and, and actually covering Web3 and crypto a lot more. Uh, because London is a kind of big hub for for a lot of like interesting and terrifying experiments in in crypto. So I think what has been interesting, and I think that this is part of a kind of broader shift in at least the conversation. I mean, like I said, Facebook continues to have billions and billions of users, and that needs to be, you know, every time one talks about people moving away from Facebook, one has to keep saying that. Uh, but I think that that Web three. It, 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 it seems like an interesting inflection point where either it could end up going the, the terrifying way of having all the awfulness of, of Web 2 plus like the, the mad financial speculation, um, which is probably what's going to happen. Uh, but it allows us at least a moment of hope that maybe um, even the, 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 the kind of return to an obsession with, with decentralization might be interesting. So, so you have Jack Dorsey after having created Twitter, uh, tweeting about his, how he's, he's, he, feels, he feels bad <laughs> now after all these years and sort of talking wistfully about the you know, IRC chat, which was like for, well actually, there might be people in this room who remember IRC chat, which was a really interesting relay form of, 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 of engagement, right? So WhatsApp is in some ways like a horrible, horrible, like Telegram seems to me like a, Slightly more, it seems to have more roots in the in the kind of IRC ethos than say something like a WhatsApp or something like a Facebook. So, so I think coming to London has uh, has certainly given me a, a new kind of thing to think about, and I and I've been finding that that very interesting. And 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 I think that it also 
weirdly, the, the last story I did, uh, well, made me think about how some of the old echoes uh, still persist. So if you will remember at the beginning of this talk, I was talking about how biometrics, you know, 1850s India. And the last story we did about was about how um, a, a Silicon Valley funded German, Germany Berlin centered startup wants to now give free crypto to every single person on earth. And then they're like, how do we make sure that no one claims their crypto more than once? And the answer is that they've designed a dystopian silver sphere, which they call the orb, which scans your eyes and converts your eyes into a uh, iris hash. And therefore it means that they now can see whether you've ever claimed crypto before or not. So you kind of see these very interesting ways. And, and of course, yeah, most of their testing is in the global south. So they've done a bit in Norway, they've done a bit in Germany, but a lot of it is in Kenya, Zimbabwe, Benin, Chile, um, some, some in Peru, a lot in India. So there are these ways in which I think, London's also a great place to think about colonialism. So I think there are these ways <laughs> in which these, these loops of technology kind of go round and round with, with a new kind of iteration each time. Um, so yeah. That, that was, that's my rambling answer to your question, which was quite open-ended. <laughs> yeah, I gave you the opportunity, or 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 uh, scanning orbs. This is this is why adults should not be allowed to read science fiction novels. <laughs> they get too many ideas. Um, we I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yes, please. The, the facial recognition tools being used on, on the journalist, yeah? Is that? Oh, by journalists, okay. Uh, so the question is, that's, that's a really interesting question. Uh, are, are any of you aware of uh, journalists using facial recognition uh, technology uh, to identify sources or people in videos? I have, I have not specifically heard or used of it, but it sounds interesting. Um, I think she, she was asking Was that to Mariana? Yeah, she was. Yeah, Mariana, sorry, Mariana, it's, um, Hello. can you address that? Yeah. Were you able to hear the question? And she has frozen. No, but she might be back. Have we lost her? Okay, if we can get her back, we'll, we'll return to, oh, Mariana? No. She's, 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 she's almost back. There she is. There she is. Yeah, there she is. Mariana. Hello, can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, now we have you. Were, were you able to hear my repeat of the question? Recognition? Yes. Um, so I guess in terms of using facial recognition, I mean, one of the ways that that, that that kind of technology can be useful to us has been around, you know, particularly um, identifying different people featured in different videos, for example, around the war in Ukraine, so attempting to identify when you know, a specific individual looks like they could be someone that we know of or you know, confirms or corroborates, for example, the presence of uh, Russian troops or the presence of Ukrainian troops in certain places and trying to kind of match, um, match those people up. But, but we, we use, you know, on the whole, pretty basic techniques, which is actually, you know, really just scrutinizing and analyzing the photographs and videos, stills to see whether the same person has come up again and again. So we did do um, um, a kind of a couple of examples of this. One was um, this woman called Mariana, not me Mariana, but a different Mariana, um, who was at the center of this um, disinformation campaign around the attack on the 
maternity hospital in Mariupol. Um, and after she was accused of staging, acting in photos, another video turned up on pro-Kremlin uh, telegram channels accusing her of taking Russian aid. Um, and there was a video featuring uh, a woman who looked quite similar, but was not the same woman. Um, and so, you know, we did a kind of uh, going through comparing that video and um, the original uh, photos of the original Mariana um, to demonstrate how they were not one and the same. Um, but similarly, you know, I, I mean, if I'm honest, I end up using reverse image search um, much more than any kind of complex tools when it comes to facial recognition. Um, particularly around, for example, there was again a video put out by the Russian embassy in the UK um, showing a woman after the attack on the theatre in Mariupol and we tracked her down to her um, people on Tagtier, got in touch with her, um, but that was just using pretty simple um, reverse image search um, and you know comparing and contrasting her to different faces. So I, I, I think that kind of I'm probably not so snazzy in my facial recognition techniques, um, but it's definitely incredibly useful when it's come to verifying, particularly a lot of the disinformation around Ukraine. Interesting. Uh, I think we have time for one more. If there's, go ahead. So that I think that the the question was about like have I analyzed kind of like extremist forums and stuff in the U.S. and what is the current state of them? Um, well, I, I will say I have kind of backed away in the last few years from doing as much um, as much uh, reporting on the hate movement. Um, but when I was at uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting a number of years ago, I had uh, kind of helped develop a kind of citizen journalism. Organi uh, citizen journalism program called the Hate Sleuths, where basically we somehow convinced um, between like 50 and 100 uh, volunteers to kind of comb through um, kind of hate forums like that and listen to like hate podcasts and like you know, do a lot of the do a lot of the kind of like grunt work because there's just so much out there and those hate podcasts they're so long they just talk forever. Um, and I think you know it was it was really it was really interesting just listening just being able to get the breadth of you know this, these folks' reports. Um, like I think a really good example was uh, we had done a piece. Um, my reporting partner at the time, Will Carlos, and I had done a piece where we got the this group of people to comb through a whole bunch of different hate forums looking for mentions of Tucker Carlson, the uh, Fox News personality. Um, and what we found was like a lot of folks were saying like, we really like Tucker. He is the person who is um, kind of mainstreaming our message and like he's saying a lot of the same kind of white nationalist things that we are saying. And that was something that we were able to do because we had like, like a lot of people were looking through a lot of forums and there was a lot of kind of continuity in that, in that message. Um, I would say, I mean, I've not been following it as closely in the last few years. I do feel like there has been kind of like, a bit of a fall off in the kind of influence, direct influence of those that particular kind of flavor of far right white nationalist groups, um, just because I think you know they kind of got a they felt like they were kind of emboldened around the kind of launch of the Trump administration and organizationally a lot of them kind of fell apart. Um, but I think a lot of those narratives are still there and they've kind of combined into kind of merged into other kind of larger kind of conspiracy narratives. Um, but again, like I don't think I've, I have not been looking at those communities as closely in the last few years and they do kind of tend to evolve pretty quickly. I think we still have two minutes. I w uh, sorry, oh, are we, yeah. okay. two minutes? Uh, Aman, I'm gonna put you on the spot a bit. Uh, you'll accuse me of a microaggression later. Uh, as, as, as our panelist, uh, our one panelist from the Global South, uh, a lot of this uh, discussion has revolved around uh, hate speech and uh, disinformation and, and, and really the, the, the quite terrible um, implications of uh, crypto, I might add, 
terrible implications of uh, technology. Um, but uh, if you were to do a solutions journalism story, let's say in <laughs> India, you know, can, maybe we can leave with a note of optimism. It's, I know it's no longer the 1960s, we're not talking about the Green Revolution, uh, you know, halcyon days are over, but is there, um, do you, is there a set of technologies or a technology uh, that, uh, a story out there uh, to, um, to give us a, a note of, of, uh, of sunshine, um, and a solution to a problem in the, you know, pre-existing perhaps in the global south? Uh. Well, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if there's a pre-existing technological... I guess the question... I guess it depends on what you're trying to solve here. And I guess uh, this is probably a, a, a subject for a totally different panel, but I think ov over the last several years, I've been kind of veering around to really rethinking again the, the question of content moderation. And I've been wondering if that is a kind of... Has this just been a, a long moral panic? And uh, I guess that's something that I've been thinking about increasingly. And there is finally um, the fact that we as the media who are, who till recently saw ourselves as the sole arbiters of information are the most excised over it, uh, makes me wonder whether it is as bad a problem as we think it is. So maybe the, may, may, maybe the note of hope uh, from the Global South uh, is that uh, maybe we've just been upset about something that isn't as big a problem as we think it is. Yeah, I think there are no <laughs> two words uh, that uh, strike terror in the heart of a technology journalist than um, moral panic. Is it all okay after all? Uh, I'm happy to uh, end on that, um, uh, on the, on that more optimistic uh, thought. Thank you, everyone. I want to thank my panelists uh, for their uh, participation. Mariana, thank you for uh, coming, zapping us from uh, the UK. <laughs> okay. I know it could be trying on, uh, on, 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 uh, on Zoom. And, um, and I want to thank all of you for coming as well. Uh, have a great, great day at the conference. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. <laughs>